Good morning, church. It is good to be with you here again, Pastor Randy. We continue this series, Beyond Coping to Hoping. Again, today looking at a difficult but real experience for many people and many people that we know. Studies show that about one in six couples struggle with infertility or nearly seven million people every year just in our country, including not just primary infertility, but even secondary, where for some reason many couples uh, have conceived one child, but for whatever reason then cannot conceive after that. So there are many people that struggle with this, including in the Bible. Some of the most righteous people in the Bible share this same hurt with you. Abraham and Sarah, Isaac and Rebecca, Jacob and Rachel, Zechariah and Elizabeth. So I think if there is one word, uh, one metaphor that best speaks to this, I think it is that of a journey. I like the word journey because a journey conveys a sense of purpose and progress, movement, as well as a destination, which is far from just a pointless passive survival mindset. But there is a journey. And today we are going to look closely at 1 Samuel chapter 1 and look at five things that we can learn from young Hannah and her journey through infertility. And it's going to help us not only gain an understanding of this struggle, but it's also going to help us understand ways that we can support those who do, as well as ultimately more about the greatness of our God who was with us in this journey. So the first thing that we learn from Hannah's experience, her journey, is that though there are many feelings and emotions associated with infertility, the one that seems to top the list is this feeling of aloneness. The feeling of aloneness, that there is just a heavy sense of human isolation, that there are few people who really understand, few people who know the depth of pain and hurt, and even few people who seem to really care about those going through this journey. And that is no different for Hannah. Hannah received very little understanding. In fact, we can even say no understanding from three people who you would thought would have understand, understood the most. Her husband's other wife, Penina, constantly Barren shamed her again and again and again, rubbed it in her face. Rather than you thinking she would be the one person who would just feel deep sympathy for another hurting woman. Even her husband, Alcana, asked, why are you so sad? Why do you not eat? And then even her priest, Eli, saw the state that she was in in the house of God and and assumed that she was just drunk. And so here is Hannah. She is hurting. She is struggling with her infertility and she is feeling alone. In fact, you know that modern studies show that infertility depression levels rival those of cancer. There are so many feelings connected in this. There are feelings of of guilt and inadequacy. Guilt that I can't give my spouse a child. Guilt that I can't give my family or the in-laws a grandchild. Feelings of inadequacy. I just don't measure up as a person, child, in-law, spouse. There are also great feelings of self-blame. This is my fault. This is my doing. As well as great feelings of loss. Loss of that experience of what it's like to be pregnant as well as to parent. Feelings of loss of, of, a, of a genetic legacy and having another heir to go on. And just plain weariness. 
just tired from a journey that often is longer and more difficult than even expected. And here again, I think we see Hannah struggling with depression in her infertility. We're told in the text that she is profusely weeping, just pouring out grief, and that she is so upset that every time it comes up strong, she also refuses to eat. She is in a very dark, heavy place, mentally, spiritually, and emotionally. And so as we consider the feelings, the emotional toll of this journey, there is an increased need for us for sensitivity. Sensitivity for two particular areas, just being sensitive of life's constant reminders for those who are in this journey of their barrenness, of their emptiness. We're told in the text that Every year, her husband used to go up and worship at Shiloh. Likely, this is for one of the three feasts that God commanded his people to earlier in the Torah, where all the men, and it was usually a family ordeal, the sons, the wives, the children would make that journey to the house of God. And so every year, three times a year, when her husband would make that journey to go worship, it was a constant reminder of all the other families who had kids and stuff, including his second wife, that she did not. And it's then that the pain would just increase even more. Maybe we haven't realized the constant reminders that are even in our day and in our culture, such as Christmas, is difficult. There are no extra stockings to hang. There are no other presents under the tree. Thanksgiving gathered with families when maybe there are other cousins, nieces, nephews around, but not from yourself. We had a couple at the seminary who shared with us, it was really eye-opening that the hardest day for them to go to church was Mother's Day. The one day, even as seminarian and his wife, they did not want to go. And that includes Father's Day because the men grieve this as well. Also, constant reminders out shopping when seeing young families, moms, dads, carrying child seats, pushing a stroller. Even baptisms, a constant reminder of the longing, the emptiness inside. So not only do we need to be sensitive with the constant reminders of this valley, this journey, but it also includes a sensitivity with our words. We're told that Elkanah used to say to his grieving Hannah, Am I not worth more to you than ten sons? The short answer to that is no, he was not. And words, though he was well-meaning, words like that still stirred and hurt Hannah in her spirit. In fact, Scripture says in Proverbs, the power of our words, that words are like sword thrust. They go, they cut, they hurt, they wound deeply, and scars remain. But by the Spirit of God, our same tongues can be used to bring healing. So one couple shared some of the top insensitive comments that couples who are going through this dread hearing. They don't like hearing this, guess who's pregnant again. Or it'll happen when you're ready. Or so-and-so prayed and, and it happened right away. Or the words, accept it and move on. We all have problems. Or even, do you want a few pointers? It might help. Change it. Or the words, my husband just looks at me and as well as, you know, you're lucky that you don't have kids. 
Do you want a couple of mine? Or the words, you're not getting any younger. When are you going to start trying? Or even, why don't you just adopt? And then you'll likely get pregnant right after. Or even, you know what? Just relax. You're you're trying too hard. You just need to take a vacation or go on a cruise and, and just rest. See, while our words can come from well-meaning tongues, those who are closest, family, friends, even church members, have the ability to actually cause great harm. And so there's a call, an implicit call in this text to just be mindful of our words and by God's Spirit to use our tongues for healing and not for hurt. The third thing that we learn from Hannah's journey is that our God is always in control. And that is a word of grace, not harm or danger. We're told in verse 6, and these words can be challenging, that the Lord had closed Hannah's womb. There is a humble reminder here even today that in our age of medical advancements that children are never a product of simple human will, but they are always a gift that require God's divine blessing and work. We are dependent upon Him always. It is about His timetable, not ours. None of us come into this world with a list of entitlements and rights that include having children because today they can be so taken for granted. As even Solomon says there in Psalm 127, children are a heritage from the Lord, the fruit of the womb, a reward. And I know as we go through these verses, the questions that not just for Hannah and from this text, but even today is the question, why then? Why would God close Hannah's womb? Why maybe would he even do that today? And first thing to note about this whole chapter of 1 Samuel is that not once does it ever in the text give any kind of indication of judgment or punishment, that God is intentionally doing this to hurt or, 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 or make her life hard. No, it's not there. So that then also tells us today that, that when someone has some kind of depravity in their life, we cannot make armchair assessments about the reason why. For just like John chapter 9 and the man who was born blind, the emphasis is not on the cause of the man's blindness or even here on the real cause of her barrenness. But the focus is always on the God who even in the hurt will always be glorified. And the God who is so God that even in human hopelessness and weakness, he can work for good and bring life from it. Our God is in control, and that is grace and not harm. And so as we live with a humble awareness of our underneathness of God, another important implicit point in our text today is the awareness to honor God in every difficult and moral decision. One of the big difficult decisions with this journey is what about embryos? Today, right now in our country, just our country, there are over 400,000 frozen embryos. What do we do with those? I like what Rod 
Stoddard said, he said, an embryo is not a potential human life. It is a human life with potential. So every one of those embryos is a unique, precious, fragile working of God. They need to be handled with the utmost care and dignity. And so the the moral guide, even in this hard journey, is never, well, the end justifies whatever means it takes to get there. Or the greater good justifies whatever means it takes to get there. Because we are handling life, not just working with cells. Our God is in control. And he will give his godly wisdom to those who ask him. That is why we also learn from Hannah's journey, point four. And that is that prayer is like oxygen. How long can a human being survive without oxygen, without breathing air? I read that on average, the human person can live about four to six minutes without any oxygen. In some cases, maybe 10 minutes. And in extreme rare cases, maybe 15 minutes. We have to have it to survive. How much more as children of God? Prayer is like oxygen. We cannot go long without it. And that is why an emphasis of our text in 1 Samuel 1 is this. Listen to what it says about Hannah praying to God. It says she continued praying before the Lord. Prayer was never one and done for her. Move on. She continued after day, after day, after day, pouring out to her God. And then it says she was speaking in her heart, pouring out her soul before the Lord. Notice that as she continues in prayer and prayer and prayer, she's not giving it all kind of sophisticated words. She doesn't have a bunch of polished phrases. She doesn't put out there a bunch of spiritual cliches that sound all righteous and holy. In her hurt and brokenness, prayer is simply pouring out her heart and soul to the God who is there. Whatever her hurt, whatever our hurt or pain or frustration or anger, God can take that too. And so we see Hannah praying, knowing that divine help and hope is only one prayer away, that from her God and our God come peace in all of the frustrations. From him comes divine wisdom for every difficult decision. And from our God comes rest for the emptiness that just gnaws at the soul and spirit. As her priest comes to understand that she is not drunk, but she is just pouring out her soul to God in his house. Eli then sends her in peace, and he says, may God grant you your request. Those words from Eli are not a wish. They are a word from God to be received and believed. And we're told this as the text continues. 
that after they returned home, Elkanah knew his wife and the Lord remembered her. And in due time, Hannah conceived. And she bore a son and called his name Samuel. And Samuel means God hears. Every time she spoke her son's name, a reminder of the God who hears and answers prayer. And so in a great act of mercy, God shows his triumph, his power over any human weakness. And so friends, wherever you are at, whatever kind of journey you are on now, this text is proclaiming boldly to us that God deeply loves and cares about your hurt. In fact, God knows firsthand when he gave his only son, God watched his only son endure some of the most horrific, painful, hurtful, humiliating acts and words against him and ultimately dying one of the most painful deaths across by execution. And yet Jesus came out on the other side, alive, risen, reigning everything under his feet at God's right hand. This is the God who deeply loves and knows your pain and did something to change it for eternity. That's why Solomon would write in Proverbs, there is a friend with a capital F who sticks closer than a brother. Jesus lives to walk with you now, wherever you are at, whatever journey you might be on. And I know that our journeys can often be longer and the valleys deeper than we had ever hoped or expected. But with this friend who is with you now, he has three promises that you can cling to today. Your best friend promises you, I will never, ever forsake you. I will transform your sorrow and I will even work it for good. And I will give you the strength you need each day to continue your walk and greater plan with me. Remember, every journey has a destination. And because of this friend, your friend, and my friend. We know that this journey will end in joy, not sadness. It will end in great abundance, not emptiness. And it will end in hope and eternal life, not in death or despair. Friends, if you know someone who is going through this, you're in it, or, or you want to go and continue to have uh, help and growth in this, there are some helpful resources that I have found that I believe would be a blessing to you. There is a book. Here are three websites, Waiting and Hope and Infertility, Lutherans for Life, and Bethany, as they just work to let you know that you are not alone and there is a God who is there to help. In light of that, would you just pray with me right now? We want to lift all of those in this valley up in prayer. Let's pray. Lord God, you are our ever-present help in time of trouble. You are the author, the giver, the perfecter, not just of our life, but even of our faith. And Lord, we know from Hannah's story and from all scripture that you hear the cries of your children who call from their valleys, including of infertility. 
So Lord, you know who they are and where they are. Grant them steadfastness of faith. Give them a full measure of your wisdom for all those difficult decisions. Sustain them with your comforting love. And remember your promise to save all those who, like Hannah, call on your mighty name. In Jesus' strong and mighty name we pray. Amen.